we don't have to read very far into Luke's Gospel before we detect a pretty clear pattern. When we encounter Jesus, we're supposed to follow him. And our Gospel reading today is about following Jesus. Peter, James, and John, they, they all get this. The scribes and Pharisees, for the most part, don't. Those who do follow Jesus in the Gospels join a small band of men and women moving about Galilee, watching Jesus, listening to him, praying with him, and trying to live as people who are part of the inbreaking kingdom of God. They're an itinerant group, funded from the largesse of a small group of women, including Mary Magdalene, and then two women named Joanna and Susanna, about whom we know nothing more. During these initial parts of his ministry, Jesus does almost all of the talking, and the action is centered exclusively on him. And all of that changes in chapter 9, our gospel reading for today. This is a pivotal chapter in Luke. For better and worse, Jesus' followers begin to play a more prominent and independent role. The chapter begins with Jesus sending his followers out to do the same things he's been doing. Proclaiming the kingdom of God, healing the sick, relying on the kindness of others. When they return from this work, Jesus challenges them to feed a crowd with a few loaves and fishes. And they have some success in doing that. And just when it looks like they're getting the hang of things, Jesus begins to speak openly about his impending death. In the light of this, he tells them that it's important for his followers to take up their cross and follow him, follow him all the way to his death. And as this chapter develops further, Jesus continues to speak about his impending death in ways that confuse and worry his followers. They end up squabbling with each other about who's the greatest, each campaigning to be Jesus' successor. They seem wildly underprepared for what awaits them. As today's Gospel reading begins, Jesus starts his journey to Jerusalem. Although it takes several chapters of Luke's Gospel for this journey to reach its end, Jesus is now setting in motion a series of events that will lead to his death and resurrection. Just before Jesus starts out for Jerusalem, we read that the disciples come to him and say, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he doesn't follow with us. And Jesus replied, Don't stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. And then our Gospel reading begins, and once he starts on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus immediately encounters resistance from a Jewish group known as the Samaritans. These Samaritans don't welcome him because he's headed to Jerusalem. The Samaritans don't believe that God wants Jews to worship in Jerusalem, and so they won't offer hospitality to Jesus and his followers. James and John angrily step in, saying, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? These two incidents remind us that there are some serious temptations that we, or anyone else who seeks to follow Jesus, confront. We, like the disciples, can narrow the circle of who is an acceptable follower. When presented with someone casting out demons in Jesus' name, the disciples try to stop him because he does not follow with us. Their sense of the community of Jesus' followers is too narrow. Jesus counters by extending the circle of potential followers as far as possible. Whoever is not against you is for you. This is not naive and wishful thinking on Jesus' part. He knows there are a great number of people, powerful people, who are against him. And they'll work together to ensure his death when he arrives in Jerusalem. Rather than hunker down and circle the wagons, Jesus wants his followers, past and present, to see themselves as part of a wide circle of followers. 
But once you do that, you realize the body of Christ is going to include some folks with rough edges and sharp elbows. People you don't like. People who are just dislikable. People just like these early followers of Jesus and people just like us. Sharing a common life with people like this is hard. When faced with the hurt and damage we can do to each other, it seems that making the boundaries of the circle of followers a, a bit harder, a bit narrower, leaving some people out, would make life a lot easier. As we see throughout the Gospels, though, when the circle of disciples is damaged due to the actions of his followers, Jesus extends forgiveness long before he excludes. We Christians have often directed some of our harshest judgments at each other. Regardless of where we stand in the church, it seems easy for us to imitate the disciples in this gospel reading, rejectors, rejecting our brothers and sisters because they don't follow with us. And I'm not sure we can afford to do that any longer. Jesus does not expect us all to agree on such matters as who should be the Democrats' candidate for president. He doesn't require us to agree about how to finance health care or higher education or how to stop the violence on Baltimore streets. Jesus does not expect all of us to agree on when we worship, on what type of music we sing, or on how we pray and what we should wear in church. The very fact that the resurrected Jesus leaves the Holy Spirit with us indicates that he expected his followers to argue and debate and discuss with each other how best to follow him in the particular contexts in which they find themselves. Disagreement, debate, discussion, and discernment are all built into the fabric of Christianity. What Jesus will not allow his followers to do is to turn our backs on each other because we don't all follow Jesus in the same way. When those disagreements are most extreme, perhaps the best we can do is to pray to see our divided brothers and sisters as God sees them. This leads to the second temptation we may face as followers of Jesus. As Jesus and his disciples move on towards Jerusalem, they receive a pretty cold reception in a Samaritan village. We don't ever learn what Jesus thinks about the Samaritans, but we do learn that his disciples offer a call down fire from heaven on them. The disciples seem to assume that this is what Jesus wants, and they're willing to do it themselves and save him the trouble. At the very least, their pride has been damaged, and they want some revenge. But Jesus says no. Calling down fire from heaven terminates any possibility that those who reject Jesus may change. The same impulse that leads Jesus to draw the circle of his followers as wide as possible also assumes that even that circle will be a pretty porous boundary. These Samaritans may not have welcomed Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, but that might change in time. It certainly can't change if they've been turned to cinders by fire from heaven. We can't reject others because they reject Jesus. Finally, look at the three quick vignettes that conclude our Gospel reading. In each of these cases, someone is confronted with the option of following Jesus. In each case, we learn, we learn that a particular sort of attachment holds them back. Attachments to home, attachments to honoring the dead, attachments to family. Although these three would-be followers do not show Jesus the animus of the Samaritans, they each reject him in favor of their particular attachments. And as with the Samaritans, Jesus does not call down fire from heaven to consume them. But what Jesus asks of us as followers is challenging and disturbing. He calls on us to break our particular attachments to people, places, and things. 
That's not because Jesus wants us to be Stoics, people who seek to avoid all forms of attachment. Jesus wants us to be deeply, passionately attached to the world because that is the way God is attached to the world. Following Jesus is a process of gradually but comprehensively breaking our current attachments to the world so that Jesus can reform, reorient, and reorganize them. In today's reading, we see that even as they begin to walk with Jesus toward his death in Jerusalem, the disciples show us that their attachments to their own sense of community, to their pride in the face of rejection, lead them to propose exclusion and revenge. And in the face of this, Jesus firmly but gently begins to reform and to transform their attachments. By the end of our reading, it's clear the disciples still have a lot of work ahead of them before they're ready to carry on Jesus' ministry without him. But fortunately, for them and for us, it's a long road to Jerusalem. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.